talking about the response. So we're trying to learn lessons um, about organizing a response. Looking back at COVID-19, of course, we've had some serious challenges in the beginning. Um, you know, we can, we can still think about PPE. We, we think about the, uh, the, the beds, the testing, personnel, the vaccines. So we've had a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, government had to get things done in times of scarcity. And there's lessons to be learned from other crises, previous crises. And that's what we're doing. And we have a, uh, a super panel today. I'm, I'm just really, really happy that um, we have our four hosts and um, our four panelists and, and my co-host, Frederick Binanda from the National uh, Defense University in Stockholm. And, and let me briefly introduce um, our panelists. And I'm starting with uh, Professor Renata Meyer who is, I think, in London, I'm not quite sure, but uh, uh, somewhere in this world. And, um, and, and that is explainable because she has, wears many hats. Um, she's uh, head of the Institute for Organization Studies at the University in Vienna, and, um, and then also spends time at the Copenhagen Business School, and is a visiting fellow just about anywhere else. And, uh, and importantly for us, she is, um, the uh, editor-in-chief of organization studies, which is one of the top journals in the field, certainly also uh, of interest to uh, crisis management scholars. And, and it should be noted that um, they are running a special issue and will be running a special issue, which is very, and Renata, maybe you just want to say a few words while you have the audience uh, uh, on the special issue. When I get to you in a second, let me, uh, let me introduce the others and then and, uh, I think this would be nice to share. Then also on the, on the split screen, on the other, we're going to the other side of the world, we're going to uh, Beijing. And uh, uh, this is our good friend, Li Lu, and, and I always mispronounce uh, his name after 15 years, which is terrible. And uh, so I'm, so, uh, and I'm going to just let you, let you do it yourself here in a second. And, and I'm going to butcher another name, Tsinghua University, where um, Li is um, an associate professor and uh, both working on the policy side and also on the crisis management disaster side and uh, also working a lot with practitioners so uh, and and of course you know um, china was in the in the in the front line of the pandemic the the first country to uh, uh, battle with um, with these issues and uh, on the australian news this morning um, there was the news that there's a new forms of lockdown in China. Um, so, um, so even China with, with its uh, massive response also is battling with, uh, you know, with the onset of another wave. Um, and so we're all, we're all fighting this. And then I have the two guests um, here uh, in, the, in Leiden and we're happy to have with us Jeroen Wolbers. Um, he's at the uh, University of Leiden. He's an assistant professor of crisis governance and uh, at the Institute for Security and Global Affairs at our The Hague campus and affiliated with the Crisis Research Center, which, and that brings me to Paul, Paul Hart was uh, uh, founded a uh, long time ago, one of the co-founders of that Crisis Research Center has since moved on um, to uh, other places, but is now in um, Utrecht, uh, USPO, the, the School of Governance, and has done many, 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 many things. Um, and uh, he is, uh, should be noted, is the one who got me into crisis management studies a uh, long, long time ago, long time ago. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a, clearly a family and friends affair today. And, um, and I'm gonna, so we asked everybody to uh, help us understand how, how they're positioned, give, give a brief five you know, minute presentation of, of your thoughts. And I'm gonna start with you, Renata, and, 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 and you can throw in that special issue, which I'm sure uh, we all, you know, this is all good to hear. And, and I'll shut up. So Renata, the floor is yours. So thanks so much, Arjen, for the for the invitation, first of all, and, and the introduction, and my apologies for not having been 
able to be here yesterday. Uh, I'm not in London anymore. I returned uh, late yesterday evening and it, it was an interesting experience crossing the Austrian boundary coming from the, from the UK again. So it was, was uh, interesting. The special issue is about collective action in crisis and the deadline um, is end of November. The, the journalist organization studies, as Ariane was, was saying, so collective action in crisis, the call, the, the entire call is on the website of the journal. Uh, if you're interested, I can I can post it in the in the chat in, in the moment after my, my quick presentation. And of course, um, all submissions are, are very welcome. Um, I'm involved currently in a few studies that may be relevant for the crisis panel. First of all, we are studying governance gaps in the handling of the Black Summer bushfire in Australia with, with several colleagues there um, in Australia. And we have also been recently invited to study the crisis team of the city of Vienna, the COVID uh, crisis team, which is interesting maybe uh, since it, it often goes a different way from the federal government, so the city against the policies of the federal government um, and often the other states, which, which may speak to what Mena was mentioning before about the regional differences and it being interesting perhaps to compare cities with each other and not the whole national systems. And, and uh, interesting also to what Olivier said before, because it's the same person leading the crisis team than it was in 2015 in the so-called refugee crisis, which we studied back then, and so and that's why we get got invited to to study them again. So I'm not 100%. The first conversations were very interesting, but I'm not 100% sure what the data can be like at this fairly late stage in the process. Today, I want to share a few um, insights from a study that we're doing on the anti-vaccination movement, and mainly because um, the, the vaccination policy is part of what the, the panel was um, asked to talk about. We started with this uh, study in the, late uh, in the late 2019, and of course, that was before the pandemic. But now the, the, uh, the dynamics are totally different and that the pandemic and the anti-vaccination movement has completely kind of taken over. Um, anti-vaccination or vaccination hesitancy is uh, by, no mean, by no means a new phenomenon. And indeed, it, we could discuss whether this is a, a creeping crisis as well that now uh, actually uh, erupted. We're looking at social media and we see four frames appear and these frames mobilize uh, by evoking free choice, which was of course uh, famous in the um, pro-abortion movement, in anti-capitalism, so the big pharma and nature and all and these three, they are more located on the political left, plus a fourth one that we call oppression conspiracy that is more from the from the political right spectrum. So before the pandemic, these four were fairly distinct and oppression was relatively small. With the pandemic now, the interlink between these frames gets stronger and they align around an assemblage of, of generally anti-establishment sentiments. So the fact that they are quite different doesn't hinder the alignment and the mobilization, quite to the contrary, because it is taken as a sign, as an indicator that the um, oppressive edifice, the matrix is getting cracks in multiple places. The first three frames problematize, the fourth explains. So um, what is also interesting about them is that they are not science denial per se. So they do not um, talk against science, but they attack mainstream science and promote alternative science. It is not the decline of expertise per se, but they work with a different hierarchy of credibility and follow experts that have been marginalized by the mainstream science. They draw on the same categories of science and expertise than pro-vaccination uh, people, but they position a few enlightened experts against the corrupted or deluded mainstream. So um, their knowledge claims have a different structure uh, that is being studied and, and that's interesting, but it is not trivial to distinguish Herrschaftskritik per se or the calls to system changes or paradigm shifts 
from conspiracy theories, and it is clearly no coincidence that they are called themselves theor that they're theories, because they, they build on science. So what can be the consequences for the discussion here of this? And I apologize for the cursory character of these ideas, because the, the paper is kind of written for a different purpose, but I wanted to draw some, some consequences for, for us here. As always in a crisis, there is a scarcity of many things like time, resources, and several of them were mentioned already in, by the panel before. But uh, I think I can add another one, and that's the, that credibility is also a scarce resource. And via the lack of trust, and I think there will be panels on that later, it, it affects um, the capacity to act of all um, bodies, government uh, and non-government alike. The mistrust is not against parts of the state, so like the police or medicine or politicians or individual groups of experts like, I don't know, economists or, or um, management, etc. But it's a mistrust towards the cultural institutions like the media, the mainstream science, university courts are being under attack and the administration per se. There's an interesting um, assembly of a seemingly more general anti-authoritarian sentiment, which has a great openness for alternative authorities. So alternative exports, alternative media, uh, even if the people hold prominent power positions in the old established system, we've seen that in, in North America with the last presidency. This sentiment is appealing across traditional divisions such as left and right. Um, and this is what we are observing when the media kind of wonders why hippie moms and, and fascists are marching together. All this makes it difficult for the mainstream institutions to back each other, but also to blame each other. And quite, it's quite to the contrary. The negative spillover effect affects them all. So we were talking about blame shifting in, in the panel before. Blame shifting in, in such a structure does not work. It actually backfires because by um, attacking others within the system, um, the entire system uh, gets weaker. Many of the, the crisis response systems that we have in place are built on the assumption that there is a basic credibility. So I would like to throw into the discussion, what are the consequences if this basic credibility does not exist or is eroding? What are the degrees of credibility that are required uh, in order not to make our responses fail just because people do not believe in, the, in whatever actors um, are out there to respond? Now back to, to vaccination uh, before I conclude. How do we move forward in this in in uh, this architecture of the anti-vaccination frames that are out there? We see a lot of uh, different responses by the states uh, with regard to lower vaccination rates and uh, what is out there to motivate the, the currently non-vaccinated people to get a, a jab. Well, one um, opportunity is to enforce vaccination. Um, if I look at in the, this kind of enforced vaccination policy uh, against the, the frames that we see out there is that policy would provide the empirical evidence for the oppression frame and sort of just showing that it's correct. To rely on better arguments, so try to convince people that the edifice of the argument that they're putting forward is fairly closed. So, so it is difficult to make an argument that can actually stick, that can claim validity within the form of argumentation that is out there. To incentivize, that would mean to buy. And that is way too close to the capitalist logic, which is strongly opposed by the proponents of this frame. To exclude people who are not vaccinated, that strengthens it's the us and them distinction and even further closes the boundaries of the, between the in-group and the out-group. So they all do not seem very promising in the face of what we see there. Now, um, I'd be very interested to hear what the other panelists think about them and of course what the, the overall audience think and what policies 
are out there that that look promising um, against this sentiment that is out there. So that was my short statement. Thanks so much. Well, I was indeed thank you very short, but packed with uh, questions and insights. And um, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to start assigning responsibility. So Frederick is going to be assigned with. Uh, <laughs> um, Answering the question, what are the consequences of eroding credibility for for practice? You know, you know, how do you deal with that? And and uh, and of course, um, um, I'm sure everybody you know can can say something about the because the vaccination politics is happening here in the Netherlands as well, and other countries I'm sure in Austria has staked out some extreme um, territory there. So um, uh, it'll be interesting to uh, return to that. Thank you so much. Go to Jeroen, and Jeroen has uh, um, studied uh, regional organizations, how they coordinate, how they work together in, uh, in making things happen. So uh, uh, let's hear from Jeroen. Yeah, thanks, Arjen. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm trying to, to bridge the boundaries a bit with a public administration <laughs> background, and, uh, and um, most of my research now focusing on uh, organization studies, actually. Um, and. I was thinking about the topic, right? Logistics is, is one of the one of the main main issues here, uh, and and dealing with scarcity, and and therefore I wanted to go back a bit to my experience in uh, in the field of disaster science and disaster studies, um, where of course logistics after disasters is one of the key issues, um, and one of the major problems in, in, in disaster logistics is very often the last mile of aid. Um, it's very, it is relatively easy to, to reach the people that are hidden in, 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 the, in the bigger cities in a, in a country, uh, but more difficult to, to reach the remote communities. And if you translate that to the, to the COVID crisis, of course, that also holds for how do you reach the most vulnerable, because the people in the disaster often in the more remote communities are more vulnerable. Um, and we've seen that as well in this crisis, that it's quite difficult to develop an understanding of who is actually the most vulnerable um, in this crisis. So the elderly people, were they indeed uh, on the agenda of, on the first instance or not? So we see clearly that, um, you know, dealing with, with, with resource and, and logistics uh, is a scarcity question, but also a vulnerability question here, which, which makes it uh, inherently political. Um, and then it becomes more about connecting different networks. Um, in disaster studies, that holds for us as you have an international response network coming to the scene, and that needs to connect with the local uh, community networks, often just very simply in logistics, in terms of procuring trucks to get to the, to the different areas. But in, in terms of COVID, that also holds, of course, in, in, in a network style of thinking with the medical sector that is organized in networks. There's no lead agency there, they're all in the in independent organizations that kind of have a, a, a similar goal, but sometimes and very often we've seen that, of course, with the, with the trouble of, of passing around uh, patients to different IC uh, bats, also conflicting goals uh, in terms of, of taking care of your own hospital first. So this is a network question to, to that extent. And, and that brings us to the, to the second point, so, so moving a bit from, from the disaster logistics towards the, the idea of network governance, a uh, main topic in, in public administration, and, and when you think of the typologies used there, and, and, and I, I like public administration in that sense, it's a very uh, clear, well-organized field, right? Reality tends to come in three or fives. Um, and in, in the typology of, of network governance, we, we uh, know the lead agency, uh, the participant-led network or the network administrative organizations, so one organization that is sent in to, to coordinate the network. And we've seen that last form occurring pretty often um, in, in the COVID crisis where different agencies, at least in the Netherlands, were created to, to coordinate uh, the network and to deal with the scarcity. But then it got me thinking about, is, is this really the typology we need? And, and there's also what you get in the, in the, in the in the network governance studies is that reality is of course more complex than that. These different elements uh, coincide, occur uh, simultaneously. So a public administration scholars tend to say the reality is hybrid. Um, but where do we get there if, if reality is hybrid? So, so in terms of the, the scarcity issues, we also need to think a bit beyond uh, that theoretical domain. And, and I was inspired by the work of Manuel Costels, who of course talks about 
programming networks and switching capacity, so power in networks, which relate very much to the scarcity questions here that are, that are in place. So how, so how are these networks actually programmed, these newly set up networks who gets to be included in the network, who's excluded, but also, and that's what Castells gets to, but what's quite important is what are the norms, the dominant norms in the network. Um, and then if we make the, the connection back to, to disaster studies, um, where we often see that the, um, the, the norms that are brought in are generally do not reflect the norms that are um, there in the, in the affected communities, uh, who have a, a very different belief, cultural belief very often of a situation. And that tends to bite back. Um, so, so what are the dominant norms in, in those response networks and do they, are they able to, to incorporate um, the ideas that are in different communities in the society. And, and that topic got back to us, I think, in, in terms of the vaccination policy. So how do we reach, in terms of the last mile of aid, how do we reach the last people that are uh, just not buying the, the medical rationale? Um, and how do we connect to those networks? And, and I think, at least in the Netherlands, but maybe an international problem as well, we, we kind of fail to do that. We fail to take in um, other communities get into their cultural beliefs and knowledge base and 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 try to at least explain to them uh, in, in their own language why this might be beneficial for them um, so we see that uh, the different norm set tends to compete um, ac across these networks and I think that's an interesting topic to to maybe explore with each other um, be, yeah, because this, this is what bites back all the time. And also if you think about how the medical system is organized in the Netherlands in terms of norms, it's, it's a market efficient system which bites back in a crisis where you need more redundancy and more resources. So these things I think are at stake and, and show us how maybe vulnerable our systems are to some extent. Um, and, and that all yeah, relates back to the issues of, uh, of resource scarcity and uh, logistics. Thank you, thank you, you. And this this ties into what uh, Anat was telling us, you know, with the different frames, and uh, and you know, we can we can wonder how different frames, different organizations working together in networks, um, you know, how that sort of then then affects both the performance of the network and how how that performance then is perceived by the people who should be. Um, benefiting from that performance. So um, a very interesting question that we're, um, I have no idea if we have an answer to it, but it's a, it's a good good place to start. Let's see, uh, Paul, um, scribbling away, and um, very curious to hear your insights. Thank you. Um, I might be a little bit disobedient in, in the sense of not, not necessarily speaking to, um, um, to the themes raised by my predecessors, but hopefully adding something to the mix, uh, and if there's time, I certainly have responses to what I've heard so far from my colleagues. Um, I wanted to, um, to test the waters on, um, uh, if you like, a, a, temporal, um, a temporality perspective on um, crisis uh, response matters. Um, I got fascinated by, and I think it was probably touched on in previous panels, this notion that we are now in this era um, where you've got um, creeping crises, if you like, chronic crises, uh, and acute ones coexisting in the fact, in fact, the former continuously throw up the latter, so to speak. Um, and, and that basically those are two different temporal logics of processing, you know, difficult issues, uh, if you like, orchestrating responses. You know, one is the long haul, the other one is the kind of the real time. And, and so I've gone to kind of time theories or social time theories a little bit to, to, to explore what's out there and whether there are categories there that might help us uh, interpret uh, what is going on in, 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 um, in responding to what I have started to call, uh, I suppose, dual crises. You know, creeping and uh, creeping chronic on the one hand, acute on the other, all, all, all blended together, so to speak. And I've come up with maybe four insights that I just wanted to test. First is sort of to, to start looking at crisis responses in terms of issues of, or the perspective of speed and timing. Um, uh, and what I found interesting in COVID, but also in the GFC, the great financial crisis, um, 
was that the main onus of the response, of the early response, was on organizations that were not necessarily equipped for speed. Uh, you know, health, for example, in our country, the health ministry uh, is a policy ministry, it's almost like a meta-governance ministry, doesn't do any uh, service delivery itself, etc., etc., has contracted everything out. Uh, and all of a sudden, they, they have to make these kind of highly consequential, real-time decisions. In the GFC, it was ma mainly, you know, treasury ministries, finance ministries, and so on. I lived in Australia at the time of the GFC, and, and there we had a secretary of the treasury who gave one piece of advice to the prime minister, which was very uh, important. It was uh, go early, go hard, and go households in terms of stimulus. And I think, um, you know, Menno van Duin introduced some positives. Uh, I think a positive aspect that we really need to study is how well some of these non-usual suspect organizations actually did on speed, uh, particularly on the economic and the social policy side, particularly all those massive income support uh, schemes and business continuity schemes that were rolled out within days. Um, we're talking about spending billions, tens of billions of, of euros or dollars or whatever the currency happens to be. Uh, you know, the, the, the jury is still out on how all this works, but uh, I think it's very important to note what we have not seen. We have not seen mass unemployment. We have not seen food riots or anything like that. So I think there's something to be studied there around the, the, the cap capacity for speed. Um, the second perspective is time horizons. Um, I'm going back to the kind of Iraq war, um, which was one of those cases where, you know, they were they were. Yeah, pretty good at, I suppose, working out what they needed to do to, you know, to get Saddam gone. And then there was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing, really literally nothing in terms of planning, okay, what's next? So it's one of those cases of, if you like, institutional myopia. Um, and we know from you know, research on stress, etc., that the potential for myopia in policymakers and in policy groups that are under a great deal of stress in your typical acute crisis response mode, that that potential is very big. Now, if you're responding to an acute crisis within the context of a, of a creeping one, then you cannot afford to be myopic. You, you need to sip, have the capacity to be simultaneously acting in the moment and consider uh, long-term implications, precedent setting, and so on and so forth. Um, and. I have the impression, but it's not more than an impression, that that, that capacity is still pretty weakly developed, uh, particularly when, when, you know, like now the numbers are rising again, and we go into our kind of myopic mode of, okay, you know, when, when will we have the next lockdown, will we bring the masks back, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I'm, I'm not convinced that there is even organizational capacity organized into or close to the center of government responses that keeps doing that kind of longer term contingency thinking. The third, I've got four categories if I may, Arjen. Mm. The, third, the, the third one is, I suppose, the tension uh, or maybe the degree of alignment or misalignment between what I call response logic and what one might call adaptation logic in, in uh, dealing with crises. Response logic is here and now, consequences management, getting busy in event time, in real time. And it's basically about lowering the heat on the system, uh, or, you know, lowering the pain that's inflicted on the system. Adaptation logic is very different. It's about sequencing, pacing, uh, discerning the capacity to um, capitalize on useful uh, improvisations that are, that are occurring as part of the response. Um, it's also about coming to terms with the revealed realities of weakness and strength of systems once they are put under pressure. Um, you know, uh, in a way, we, we are still a bit captured in this, in this discipline of this fraternity of crisis scholarship. It's still captured by the old FEMA model, which suggests that the really important aspects of crisis management are prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. Adaptation, to me, is, is something way beyond uh, 
and more sophisticated than recovery. It's sort of, I, I would suggest that that might be the, a replacement category there, because uh, adaptation is really about confronting the reality that we cannot go back to the way things were before, and that we need to kind of have a very long-term effort to come to terms with, you know, the realities that the, the crisis throws at us. And my hypothesis would be that, that cases like COVID suggest that our response machineries, um, imperfect as they are, uh, are infinitely better re, uh, uh, well equipped and institutionalized than our adaptive uh, capacities. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there, organizing for the long haul, if you like. And finally, if we, uh, there, there might be some implications from this temporal uh, uh, perspective on, on how we evaluate crisis responses. I guess our familiar repertoires of evaluating crisis responses uh, have to do uh, with, you know, do we get, you know, the right stuff to the right people in, 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 at the right time, whether it's protective gear or uh, support from blue light or red light or medical people, etc. There's, there's process evaluation that we tend to do, uh, which is around um, how evidence-based, how proportionate are, are, are these responses? Is legitimate use being made of government powers and so on? Uh, are we taking into account soft voices? Uh, and uh, as Renata is saying, are, how are we dealing with divergent perspectives in the way we or orchestrate and organize policy making in a crisis? Uh, there's political uh, evaluation, you know, what is the level of legitimacy, credibility, and so on. But I would add a fourth one to that mix, which is the, if you like, the endurance uh, perspective on how we evaluate a response. There's two categories to that. One is how, how can they keep going uh, for a very long time? Uh, I've, I've observed firsthand the, the level of exhaustion uh, that we now see at the top of some of the key ministries and agencies that are dealing with it. People are just very, very, very tired because they haven't had the discipline that, let's say, military organizations or operational organizations have in, you know, dealing with their, their staff and, and dealing with the potential that you have to keep going for a very long time. But then secondly, and you wouldn't be surprised, endurance, I think, should also be, be operationalized in terms of uh, the adaptive quality of those uh, responses. Um, uh, so how good are we in tackling uh, th this crisis over time as it mutates, rather than, than being naive about somehow, you know, curbing it, killing it, uh, and recovering from it? Those were my introductory remarks. Thank you, Ari. Thank you so much. Well, this is uh, rich material, and... Um I have questions, I'm sure, Frederick. We're going to let Frederick kick off the discussion. Uh, and meanwhile, um, we will collect uh, uh, questions from people um, on, you know, in our virtual community. Uh, people here who might be, like, uh, we already have one person who wants to ask a question. And um, so um, we're going to we're going to organize it a little bit, and we'll see what happens. But uh, enough to talk about. So, uh, but I'm going to let Fred kick off the discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think these were really interesting perspectives, and there's a common thread here somewhere. I, let's see if we can find it. Um, and I'm going to pick up where sort of Paul left off. It seems to me that. Some of the things that we've seen, how governments and uh, you know, public administration systems got into a race, a race for very different things. We've heard about some of them to get people to wear face masks, to get vaccine coverage among the citizens. It sort of obscured some of the other things. And, and it seems to me that a lot of governments realized early on that performance is going to build legitimacy. That was a very simple equation. And now we're running into all kinds of problems that has to do with endurance, that has to do with how do we keep people's trust uh, in what we're doing and in the fact that there needs to be a lot more actors than the ones that we see in the media involved in order for us to do something about this. So my, my question, I think really to all the panelists here, are, are we dealing with much more value complexity than we thought 
a year ago or six months ago even, in terms of how do we build this enduring response to COVID-19? Well, that, that, is a com that is a nice common thread, I would, uh, I would say. And um, um, let's, let's go now to, um, I'm, I'm gonna kick this back to you because uh, you, you've heard all this. You started with uh, um, putting trust on the table, credibility as you, as you uh, um, was the concept you put on the table. And um, what comes to mind when you hear uh, Frederick ask that question? I mean, I think um, it's it's perhaps two different questions actually. One is is the the uh, idea of how does the government deliver among those people who actually believe it can deliver and it will deliver and it should deliver, and I think in that uh, hopefully large segment of of the population, all these things kind of kick in. It's the question, how quickly can you provide face masks? How quickly can you get the vaccination going? And we saw the EU getting into serious troubles with kind of not um, having the, the delivery schedules there. We saw like the face mask, as, as Xiaoli was, was saying, uh, being a, a, a big issue. So there the performance, I think all these questions, they, they kick in and are very important. I'm also seeing another part of the uh, population who doesn't expect government to deliver at all. And actually all these kind of deliveries that, that government and administration provides is seen as, as either um, just being another cog in the machine uh, that should be stopped. So, and I mean, we all, all countries, we all have them, uh, the weekly demonstrations against all, all the measures. And they are not demonstrating for faster face masks or for quicker vaccination and, and uh, quite to the contrary, so totally the difference. So I think that here is a split actually in, in terms of the population. And um, while the one would be smoother response and, and quicker kind of capacity to act would be, would be the answer. The other one, I would be very doubtful that any of the things that, that kind of uh, would, would make this, the system more responsive, more adaptive would, um, calm down this this debate. So I think it's a it's a very difficult question. It's probably something where at least for me I have to learn to acknowledge that there is a split um, that is not easy to to bridge and not with good arguments and not with um, I don't know the usual measures that that would take. I don't know if this is an answer or even making the thing more complicated. Well, I, we're we're always very good at complicating things, so that, that that's uh, that's what we live for. Um, but I'm I'm going to try to simplify just a little bit. So, if uh, if as Frederick says, and 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 I think what Paul's implying, um, and and uh, you know the other the both other gentlemen have have described that the focus was on performance, you know, delivering stuff in the here and now. I mean, Shaoli gave a very detailed sort of the entire Chinese government. Uh, focusing on face masks and um, um, and Paul says well you know that's all nice and, and this but we need this other perspective because there's so much more in terms of you know endurance and long-term adaptation um, and and of course it could be that in heat in the heat of the crisis you know they they don't have time for this you know that's a possibility but let's assume for a second that they're so enlightened these leaders um, do you think it would be actually, would it be possible to, I mean, you're talking about a, a value complexity in, in messaging. How, how do you talk about this? It's so much easier to talk about, you know, we're going to put our government on this and make this happen and this happen. Then start, you know, in, on day four about the long term ad, adaptation and, and, um, and then when that comes in, they're tired and people don't want to think about it. And, and, and you know they're almost stuck in the rut of, of their operational mindset, if you will, because this the, this whole performance thing that, that you that you highlight, this generates that operational reflex in these people that you're talking about, and that's why they're so tired because all they're doing is you know calling around to find face masks that the Chinese are making for themselves, and um, 
and, and they're right. So, Paul, how do you reflect on that? Yeah, you know, I, I wrote down here, monitorial democracy meets crisis management. Um, uh, you know, I don't know whether you're familiar with the concept, comes from John Keane, uh, but this notion of, of governments being, if you like, hyper, hyper monitored by an ever uh, thickening and expanding array of both formal and informal monitorial mechanisms, you know, whether it's parliaments or the media or ombudsmen, but increasingly those communities that Renata um, uh, talks about, they do their own monitoring within, you know, locked within their own frames. Um, uh, 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 and, and in networks where very different norms uh, and expectations apply. So in a way, I, I agree with Renata that if you, if you go into crises like these with only that kind of almost, almost technocratic uh, perspective on oh, if we only deliver the goods, you know, uh, we'll be fine then you're kind of, uh, to use a Bushism, misunderestimating the nature uh, of the issues. Uh, you know, there's a reason why, why certain crises are creeping. And, and usually that has to do with value complexity and opposed interests and, and so on and so forth. Uh, if it were simple, we would have taken action on these things. So, so once, once they throw up, um, you know, an acute event, an acute pandemic, uh, an acute weather event, etc. Uh, sometimes the you know the the starkness of the the value conflicts is being revealed. So if we take that issue of scarcity management that Charlie talked about, um, I guess the standard crisis management response is very analytical. Who's most at risk? Uh, how can we maximize production and, and and distributive capacity and so on? And the whole system gets busy. Whereas you cannot get around the fact that the actual issues are moral. Uh, to a large extent. Who are the most vulnerable? Who are the most useful? Remember we had these lists of you know, uh, essential professions and essential sectors and so on. But, but now in this stage with vaccination, we also now uh, ask the question, who are the most and least worthy uh, of you know, getting scars, vaccine and so on? And those are very deeply uncomfortable questions, I think, to to the crisis management profession. These are fundamentally political uh, questions, etc. So if you've got ministers going into, I'm the crisis manager in chief mode, they forget what they're actually voted for, which is to help societies work through these complex moral issues. Um, so there's an, an odd mismatch that has been revealed between governments, well-meaning, whether they're Chinese or Dutch or Austrian or whatever, well-meaning going into something as big as this with this kind of performance technocratic kind of paradigm uh, and at various points in the crisis hitting the, the wall on, on that um, and so there has to be a lot of what, what in the previous panel was called intra-crisis learning uh, but that's kind of a euphemistic term for people having to fundamentally you know reconsider what their role is really their role is and what their priorities should be but, but the, the tension that we're talking about between the operational and the political. Um, and, and so you, you were talking, and Minnow talked about this in the previous panel. You know, he said we should, we should study these emerging organizations everywhere and, um, and not just focus on prime ministers. But, just, you know, but bringing in those, and, and you mentioned them. And, uh, but isn't the emergent organization is in a way a, te a technocratic response? You know, we, we, we can't resolve it. So we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna build something new and, and, then we're, and we present that as a solution and then it gets its own logic and it keeps going and then we just really get stuck in that uh, seemingly great step in terms of enhancing performance. Yeah, yeah, and, and we seem to be quite good in that, right? So, so there was a lack of breathing apparatus and, and within weeks, all of these things were shipped around the world and uh, created, and and that seems to distract a bit from the um, from the underlying aspects. And, and that was also what has struck me in your your know, comments and, and the discussions we had in the previous days. What what makes these crises creeping? So what disappears under the radar? And in terms of vaccine policies, for instance, I, I wonder like. Um, we're now distributing in the Western world all these vaccines, but the underlying creeping crisis is that we need to tackle the global 
uh, uh, COVID spread in order to prevent all different kinds of virus uh, uh, variants appearing and, and putting us in the, in the next phase of the crisis. So there seems to be a whole um, interesting discussion here that, that indeed in the I mean, response phase we, we are so focused, like you mentioned, on, on the acute aspects and, and uh, quite technocratic and, and can solve that versus it's much more difficult to address those underlying issues that, that make, that prolong this crisis actually, that, that make it more difficult to, uh, to manage. Just adding on to that, um, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I, I contrasted the analytical uh, to, to the moral approach to managing scarcity, but there is a, actually a third approach which, which is, highlights what you s describe as the tension between an operational and a politi political logic which I call the expediency approach to dealing with these scarcity issues. Uh, and so this issue of the global south, you frame in terms of basically, um, you know, us being, us needing to go and, and uh, distribute vaccine down south, so to speak, because it's in our own interest to kind of curb the, the disease there. Um, I would also say um, that the expedient question that's being asked is which countries can we in the global south can we not afford to ignore uh, because they're economically crucial to us because otherwise China will capture them, uh, you know, with more masks, yeah. uh, etc. Saudi will buy them uh, masks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, why did Israel get, um, you know, so much uh, of Pfizer so quickly? is because Netanyahu was on the phone uh, 17 times, I believe, to the CEO of Pfizer. So let's not blind ourselves to the power of lobbies mm -hmm. and lobbying and interest groups uh, in, uh, in, you know, dealing with all these scarcity uh, questions. Uh, so there's that, that's, uh, you know, politics as, as political as it gets. Behi hiding uh, behind the operational then. That's right. Yeah. We've got... Uh, yes, we have... Um, yeah. um, I'm very happy that, uh, to uh, introduce Beatrice de Graaf, professor at uh, Utrecht University, friend of our project. Uh, welcome, Beatrice. Yes, thank you very much, Arjen. I'm fascinated uh, uh, by the discussion that's being launched here in this panel between these different perspectives on crisis. And I really like the adept perspective that uh, Paul brought in. But I would like to add an historical perspective and uh, confront you with the fact that the gap that Renate was introducing into the discussion, uh, bridging the gap, this gap has been there in history all the time. There was never a moment that there was 100% legitimacy in the government. There was never a moment that everyone bought into government prescription. So my point is more that uh, at present, historically speaking, we, at, we are in the Western countries uh, of Europe uh, at a very high level of trust in government, at a very high level of vaccinations as well. If you take the late 19th century, the early 20th century, the 50s, uh, uh, there was a lower level of vaccination and trust in government than there is now. So my question would more be, um, why do we need to always see crisis management as a state. I was rereading uh, Scott's book, Seeing It Like a State, yesterday. And this book is all about making society legible in order to manipulate it. So we want to make those people that refuse the vaccines, we want to read them, we want to understand them in order to manipulate them. But why do we need it to see it as a state? Why can't we just accept that is the condition humaine that not everyone will buy into government prescriptions? The only problem today is that this minority is so vocal. They didn't have internet in the 50s. They didn't have uh, uh, the stage that they had in the 19th century. You could just ignore them. So we cannot ignore them anymore. But my question to this panel is, is there a concept thinkable in terms of adapting to crisis for the long haul and accept the fact that there will always be a 10-15% of minorities that do not see it like the state does? We all are sort of part of the corporate um, governance structures of the state, but why does that need to be the case? Why, why do we need to be so utilitarian, so benthamite, eh? the, the, the biggest happiness uh, for the, the most of the people? Well, that's a very utilitarian approach. And you could bring in other philosophical approaches in saying respect the minority and the freedom of the smaller segments in society. So it's a question to you. Can you adapt and work around that gap instead of wanting to bridge it with all the force that you have in you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. And this is a, a you know, very timely question. And we're talking, you know, we're really getting into the normative domain. But um, as a hypothesis, and I'm throwing this out and, and I'll let you react to it. And, and then we'll bring in our other good friend, Magnus, who's uh, appearing here on the screen, which is great to see. Um, but you know, the, the idea of perfection, the perfect, perfect response, because that's what we're really talking about. You know, why are we not accepting a good response? And uh, because, you know, if we would have all signed up for 85% vaccination rate six months ago, and, um, and now all of a sudden it's not enough, and, and this operational mindset, as, uh, as Beatrice uh, is describing, gets going, so let's kill this problem too. And, um, and, and of course, you know, um, this is not gonna happen, um, because Renata was explaining in two minutes why the logics and the frames you know, that, that have been institutionalized over a year, a year and a half, or may have even been historically there, pretty much a guarantee that the approaches of uh, enforcement are going to be counterproductive, if anything. Um, so what's happening here? Okay. Does it have anything to do with uh, blaming? Or is it, is it um, uh, or we just don't know, you know, are we so seduced by our capacity to solve all these other problems, so we'll just deal with this one too? And, and these are open questions. I have no idea. Uh, who wants to give, give it a shot? Well, I, I, I can say something. Um, you know, in a way, Beatrice and, and Renate both throw up the problem uh, of passionate minorities. What do you do with passionate minorities, people with e extremely strong convictions? Um, and I think Beatrice's little history lesson was very useful uh, in that regard. Maybe we get a bit... <laughs> overworked, uh, you know, not aware, we're sort of not aware of, of um, how good we have it by comparison. We are working ourselves up in a frenzy of, of you know, perfect, um, uh, not just legibility, but also perfect control. Uh, at the same time, why, why are we so adamant that we want to, to reach out, you know, the last, uh, or, or get the last 15% to comply uh, because, uh, you know, the basic parameters with which we, we steer in this crisis, which is, you know, IC capacity, uh, reducing, uh, you know, hospital admittance, as long as those are the dominant values, um, then, you know, having 15% unvaccinated appears to be not good enough. Um, so, so we're kind of a prisoner of decisions about the key values that, that we have prioritized very, very early on in that response mode, they still haunt us. There's, there's been very little reflective activity to kind of reconsider uh, that. And there is something normative to be said that we can measure the, you know, the degree of civilization of a political system uh, in the way it treats uh, its uh, passionate minorities. Um, and, uh, you know, we can also look at uh, Carl Schmitt's work, you know, who gets to make, who gets to decide on the exception uh, and, and the kind of state power that is brought to bear on those, uh, you know, the, the uncompliant ones, so to speak. So I think it's, it's something that we as a community of crisis management scholars should, should take much, you know, we should make this part of, of what we study. And, and if I'm really candid, we haven't, right? We haven't so far. It's a very technocratic uh, field. Uh, so, so maybe the big uh, uh, takeout from this whole COVID experience um, is that we need to think much more broadly about politics. So far, we think about politics in crisis as, you know, interagency relationships or you know uh, blaming and so on and that's all very useful that's all there but i think this is revealing to us which may have been apparent to people who are not crisis experts uh, how how the crises of our era will throw up very fundamental political questions and that we can learn from history uh, in 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 getting a perspective on on what might happen uh, when when we respond to those political challenges in different ways very good, and I see, and, and uh, I'll let Renata jump in here and, and before we go to Magnus. 
Very quickly only, just to follow up on what Beatrice was saying, I do not think we can bridge, we can build bridges. What I was trying, the point I was trying to make is that a lot of the measures that we're taking is actually they're enlarging the, the division, then enlarging the, the cleavage between the groups. And we're not building bridges. And that this kind of division will probably fall back on our heads in the next crisis. Because then when you have to rely on credibility of whatever established institutions again, and if we div divide, if, if we're increasing the divide, then we are undermining the, the capacity to act in the next um, crisis. So I wasn't claiming to that we have to bridge or that whatever we, should, we it, it, it's our moral responsibility or whatever, but just saying that by the measures we take, we're actually doing the opposite of what, what we want to do. Well, that's, I, I think an, an important uh, um, comment. Um, thank you, Renate. And uh, let's go to, um, I don't know if it's Stockholm or Uppsala, and it looks like, I'm going to say Stockholm, and um, by the looks of it. And uh, am I right, Frederick? Yeah. Yes, I'm right. And, and we're going to our, uh, uh, our young father, uh, congratulating him from Leiden with the, the birth of his son, Carl. Um, Magnus, one of our co-organizers, uh, happy uh, to have you with us, Magnus. Good morning. Good morning, Arjen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with us in this conference. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it, but I'll come next time. And I would like to thank you for this great panel. I learned so much. Uh, and I have two questions. I have more questions, but I, I, I limit myself to two questions. One to Professor Lu on China and one to Paul. My first question is, uh, I would like to know more about how the public has reacted to the authorities' action. Ha, has it been, the performance been seen as a success or a failure, or what's the reactions to the Chinese authorities' performance? That would be great to hear more on. And to Paul, uh, you brought up one, one of my my special interest in time, but I think you, you, you formulated it so well. It's two timelines here, and how do we make them connect? And my question to you is, how big of a challenge is this, really, the temporal dimension to existing crisis research? You, 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 were, you were saying uh, that we're going prevention, preparation, coping, and so on. That doesn't doesn't catch the, 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 the dynamics now. Uh, the question, uh, of course, is spurred by the fact that because after COVID, m many of us have lamented that why don't the policymakers read our stuff? Why haven't they learned anything <laughs> going all our courses, going through all our uh, uh, syllabus and so on? Why don't they take this on? And we have to be self-critical. What kind of research do we produce if we leave out the temporal, the, the key temporal dimensions? That's, that's the challenge we run into when we, we are writing about creeping crisis. Where is time here? Because this time is everything for the poor policymakers. And we write about these phenomena and processes as if time didn't exist. Uh, so how should we develop our own discipline, so to say? Paul, to catch these temporal dimensions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magnus. Big questions coming from Stockholm. And Frederick, you want, you want to add a question to this? Yes, and I think that would be to all panelists, really. Uh, so we've been talking about the tension uh, that we see. Uh, there's conflict around dealing with these issues. And um, I think we saw in most countries that there was kind of a rally around the flag effect early on. We were you know, uniting in the fight against COVID. It usually ended in a few weeks or a month or so. Um, and the question is, is that, I assume that most government want that situation, but I can quote a minister in a country not far from here saying, we need to find the productive conflict interfaces here. We need to pick the fights before we screw up and the fights become over what we did wrong rather than some of these moral issues, actually, and some of the uh, 
the groups in society that Renata talked about. It's, it's kind of convenient for, for governments to have those fights, to picture people as anti-science, anti all kinds of things, in order to have the right kind of fights for their own political benefit. Could that be part of the equation here? All right, some, uh, some big questions, little time, speaking of time, but um, um, then Magnus um, had a question for Paul, and after that we have Frederick's question for whoever wants to pick it up in the panel. Um, but we'll first go to Paul. Yeah, uh, thank you, Arjen, and uh, thanks, Magnus, for the question, and congratulations on uh, fatherhood. Um, good luck with that. Um, um, look, I, I can only agree, in a way, uh, with what you, with the premise uh, in your question, where is time in our work uh, in, in crisis management? Well, it is there, but it is, it is embedded in this functionalist um, uh, paradigm that, that this crisis management community has long um, um, cherished, that I've tried to rail against uh, in various decades, but uh, with very limited success. So, so uh, you know, time, time, particularly this post-acute phase of a crisis, this, this is where most of the crisis uh, researchers, sh you know, stop being interested. Um, whereas, as Renata, I think, highlights very clearly, um, how we handle these issues, these, these controversies, because uh, they are controversies in the sense as defined by uh, uh, Ryan and Schoen, where, who define a policy controversy as a form of disagreement um, that cannot be handled uh, by an appeal to the facts. Because, you know, people are locked into frames or meta frames that, that are fundamentally divergent. The way we handle those things in time will have consequences over time. Uh, that's essentially what Renato was saying, and uh, I fully agree with that. And I also fully agree with the promise of the premise in Magnus's question that we tend in our field not to have that repertoire. Ma Magnus, you were the exception, and in fact, your book was not written in the context of crisis management studies, but EU studies. Um, so, in a way, we within crisis management research, we can import stuff that is out there. Whether that ultimately gets policymakers uh, interested in what we do, I um, doubt, uh, and that's where we have ourselves to blame a little bit. Uh, yeah, having navigated the time literature, the time and governance literature recently, uh, I was struck again by its extravagant uh, abstracts, abstract nature. Um, so we need to find words in, in, for inspirational, time. Inspirational, you mean? <laughs> no, we need we need to find words for time and the temporal yeah. dimension of governance uh, that are couched in in language that policymakers um, appreciate, and that are put to them, you know, uh, at in moments where, where when they really care about it. Uh, and I don't think we have quite found a clue to that uh, yet. Thank you. We have um, we have a few more minutes, but we also have two uh, two folks on uh, in, and I promised uh, to uh, f field the questions or comments. So uh, uh, Olivier and Dana, um, and I want to start with you, Dana. Um, good morning, and uh, in uh, Washington. Morning. Um, so my question is mostly for Paul, I think in response to the points about adaptive responses as a way to meet the creeping crisis challenge versus the response as a way to meet the challenges of acute crises. And this really relates to my comments yesterday on paying attention to the intersection between things such as timing. Um, I think you framed it really well and I like the way that Magnus referred to this as two timelines that influence each other. So um, from the temporal perspective, how would you account for the range of responses to a creeping crisis? For example, in climate change, we have some people talking about um, adaptive responses. We also have other people thinking more about transformation to something completely new, so a, a bit of a break in the timeline. And then there's also a group of people that are talking about transition management, which kind of breaks that long-term piece into two timelines instead of one. 
Thank you, Dana. And I'm going to collect um, Olivier's question uh, as well. Olivier? Yeah, thank you. I wanted to come back to, to Renata's presentation and also to Beatrice's question, which I found really very, very important. You know, why, why are we making such a fuss about the, the anti-vaccination or the, or the fact that not everyone is vaccinated? In France, as you probably know, this is a very big deal. I mean, this creates a lot of passionate debates everywhere. You know, this is not normal. This is not acceptable. People are getting fired. Currently in the hospitals, we have lots of people in the hospitals who refuse to get vaccinated, uh, professionals which leads to closing down services, which leads to uh, poor treatments. I mean, it's, but still, there's this idea we need to force them. And I think part of the answer is probably the fact that f since the beginning of this, of this pandemic, many of the measures taken were not public health measures. They were, I would call them policing measures. They were not trying to control the virus. They're trying to control behaviors, the bodies. I mean, the, the uh, yeah, behaviors. They were disciplining measures. Um, and, and, when you, and, and, and in the French case, this is very clear. I mean, we've been trying to discipline people to behave correctly for a year and a half. Uh, and, and the fact that some people re refuse to, to behave is considered unacceptable from this point of view. So we haven't adopted a risk-based approach. We've adopted rather a, a general populational approach and trying to discipline people uh, and refusing uh, and refusing uh, the fact that someone some of them are not playing playing along and moreover the, not only are they not playing along but they are suggesting that well no this is not i mean this uh, injunction this i mean this obligation is debatable is question we can actually we can debate about it i mean should we force people to get back this is a real question and it is i think why it's also bothering the authorities because it is sort of showing underlying questions and their approach which have not been actually debated uh, so that so that was just my 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 insight thank you thank you olivier so so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take olivier's comment and frederick's question as input for our panel tomorrow when we're going to talk about legitimacy um, which I think is going to be uh, putting some fire uh, into the discussion right away. Uh, and I'm going to ask Paul to briefly, uh, as brief as you can, uh, um, address Dana's uh, uh, question. And, uh, and, then, and then we're going to have to sort of, uh, I'll give a final word randomly to someone, and then, and then we're just going to go to lunch. Paul. Yeah, look, uh, I think Dana and I need to have a broader conversation. I think we've got one scheduled, if I'm not mistaken. Um, because, yeah, I like the metaphor of the two timelines. The question is whether it is actually limited to two. Um, and, and you're using these terms like transformations or transitions and so on, which might, maybe another metaphor might be useful here, um, that there might be multiple temporal agendas in any crisis um, around, you know, where do we want to go? How, how quickly do, do we want to get there? and how linear is the path uh, to, to get there in, uh, in the first place. So in a way, what you, you've been doing is, is trying to enrich our perspective on, um, on thinking more, you could call it holistically, about crises and, and the shadows they cast on the systems in which they uh, occur. Um, so thanks for adding to the repertoire. I cannot possibly, in a in a pre-lunch uh, rush, um, do justice to your uh, your question. But I think we need to have that conversation. Thank you, Jeroen. Yeah, just one one short remark. Um, I was thinking also when we're talking about time, but but the spatial dimension is, is of equal importance here uh, to relate to that because these crises affect us in different locations differently. Uh, different countries are at different points in a, in, a w in a wave, so to say. Also climate change, some countries in other locations around the world are more prone to climate changes. So there are different time horizons occurring at different locations, which, which fits into the learning question, right? Can we learn from countries that are ahead of the curve, so to say, uh, uh, or take different responses here? Uh, so I think it's important there to, to make a temporal spatial dimension here too. Uh. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, then we're, we'll, we'll go to Vienna. And uh, the last word is for you, Renat. Well, thanks so much. I was just maybe uh, pick up once more to the, the, the topic of like politics and politicians against this whatever group who doesn't want to comply. But um, I don't think that there's actually um, one group against the other. The, 
recent elections in one of the Austrian regions brought 6% for a party that's completely new, never ran before in the election, 6%. And is the only kind of um, program that they have is anti-COVID measures by, by the government. And so that's a big, it's, 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 in the, it's in the parliament now. And we have one of the, the uh, populist, our famous populist party is an anti-vaccination party. And whenever there's elections somewhere coming up, then you can imagine that there's not going to be taken any uh, se severe or serious measures. So these things are far more intertwined at this point in time uh, to, to be ignored. So maybe that is my, my final statement. Thank you so much, uh, Renata. And then, and this, um, you know, the title uh, of this panel was really boring. And um, <laughs> but it turned out they all, that uh, it, was, it was quite a fascinating discussion, I have to say. And uh, so we we uh, managed to escape from the purely operational uh, discussion on uh, how to speed up things uh, to a very fundamental discussion. And um, which not, it's not just promising, but also sort of almost demanding of our uh, of our group. And uh, that's why we have to bring in political scientists and, and public administration scholars, organization sociologists, and uh, historians. I, 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 I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> historians, um, Beatty says, and uh, and really have that interdisciplinary discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, we're going to sign off. We're going to lunch. I hope you're you're going to do the same thing, and uh, and we'll, we're going to be back here in uh, 45 minutes. Thank you.